King's Quest 2 pretty much picks right up from the ending of King's Quest 1. Sir Graham is now King Graham, and after removing the decaying corpse of King Edward the Forgettable from his throne room, is ruling very happily and everything is rainbows, sunshine, and lollipops all around. However, Graham soon succumbs to the greatest of male illnesses, the one malady that has broken many a stronger man and has led to madness. Blue Balls. He realizes that his kingly line is going to be pretty short-lived if he can't find a way to produce a suitable heir. Alright, so it's not as shallow as all that. Graham is a good guy. All he's thinking about is companionship and giving his kingdom what it really deserves, a queen. He searches high and low across the entire kingdom, but finds no one really suiting his unrealistic expectations. The magic mirror you found last game chimes in with its own suggestion and shows you a beautiful maiden locked away in a golden or ivory or something tower in a far off land called Kolima, guarded by an evil sorceress. Sounds like perfect fantasy fodder. A quest! A king's quest! Haha! <laughs> Knowing that an impossible task must be worth pursuing, he decides that this must be the one and sets off to Kalima, knowing that the tower is only accessible through a magic portal somewhere in the land. After landing, it becomes a quest across the land to not only find the portal, but to once again altruistically solve all the world's problems en route. King's Quest 2 is running on exactly the same game engine as its predecessor because, hey, if it's not broke, don't fix it. The AGI, or the in-house adventure game interpreter engine, will go through several evolutions and permutations as games and years progressed, always striving to stay on the cutting edge. As long as you keep in mind that this was cutting edge back in 1985. Your goal upon finding this door is to find the key to said door. Everything after that is pretty much cake. The door itself is nice enough to give you hints as to where the key is located and your first hint is to make a big splash. Cheesy, I know, but workable. By the way, do not cross this bridge to the door more than absolutely necessary because the game will kill you for attempting it. Seems arbitrary when compared with the myriad of other ways this game has to kill you. Turns out King Neptune is the key master and will give it to you if you return his trident to him, which was conveniently washed up on the beach. Unlocking the door reveals only another door with the inscription telling you to set your sights high. This leads to probably one of the most difficult and ludicrous puzzles in the game. Your goal, obviously, is the high mountaintops where you are confronted by a snake. Walking by it is a no-no since the snake proves to be poisonous. Where's Cedric when you need him? The obvious choice is to kill that slither environment with a sword that you should have by now with a snake inscribed upon it. This red herring will cause your downfall as killing it, while letting you pass, will not give you an item necessary later. Every game in this series, you can argue, has a game breaker puzzle. A solution that takes such a far jump from logic that actually solving the damn thing makes you more upset than just being stuck on it. A reasoning so obtuse that even the novelization of the game throws up its hands in confusion and simply gives us this. With one swift motion, King Graham made to grab the hilt and swing the blade through the air so as to slice the head from the serpent's body. His hand grabbed the bridle's silver bit instead, and still thinking he held the sword, he flicked it through the air. Graham's hand opened in its surprise, and in result, he threw the bridle at the snake by mistake. But instead of the serpent slaying our monarch with its own quick kiss, the bridle magically transformed the serpent into a winged horse. Oh, what? What? This is... Th no! 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 Bad book! They couldn't think of a good excuse to put the bridle on the snake, so there's like, oh, Graham just accidentally threw the bridle on the snake! Happy accident, huh? <laughs> no! This is a fantasy game, guys. I would have bought anything. I could suspend my belief for anything if they would have had some hint, some preview. Maybe a, a fairy floats down into the ether and tells you that somewhere there's a magical horse trapped in the form of a beast, or there's a snake somewhere that is magical in some nature. But no, nothing. Give me some direction, guys. All right, fine. So if you want to go the Greek mythology route, perhaps the uh, Medusa is linked to Pegasus in some way, Medusa having to do with snakes, but that's a stretch. Bad book. Bad.
You get the key from the mountains and unlock the door only to find another door. And this is where you hear the collective sighs of half a million gamers from around the world and me wondering if this chick I've never met in a tower far, far away is really worth all this aggravation. The final clue says to be stout of heart, and here's where things get really obtuse. Amongst the Arcadian backdrops, you find freaking Charon himself, who has apparently not yet been promoted to ferrying the souls of the recently departed and is still the ferryman for a moat. Chiron is extremely nearsighted for all one needs to fool him into taking you across the moat is to wear a red ring and a black cloak. Well true, it turns out the castle belongs to Dracula, but still, it's gotta chafe his ass to be relegated to such a lowly position. Presented with a path of poisonous spines, you can either attempt to navigate the path, which is nearly impossible, or pop the sugar cube that you were given from the winged horse and become invincible. Enter the castle, kill Dracula, which has not done any harm to you personally, mind you, steal his key, head back to the Matryoshka door, and you find yourself at end game. Work your way to the tower and to the apparent love of your life. The only problem I really had with this game, besides the whole snake debacle, is the fact that there's no real main antagonist. I mean, sure, there's a couple baddies here and there that you need to battle, but no real bad guy to keep the plot moving and to give it any kind of sense. It's hinted that the main bad guy is supposed to be Hagatha, since that's the only sorceress you run into during the course of the game, so she's the one who must have locked a girl up in the tower, but for what reason, we don't know. With a little bit more information, we could have just wandered on over to the cave and beat the information out of the withered old crone, but no! We have to do things the hard way! The game, while running on exactly the same engine as the previous game, pushed it a little bit harder and takes us to some really unique locales like underwater, up in the clouds, and especially what I'm dubbing the tower dimension. Not to be confused with the distortion dimension. You have to remember that in 1985, this is unlike anything anyone has ever seen, exploring a world of red trees, pink skies, purple seas. I hear the moon's green clovers, blue diamonds, and purple horseshoes. The vast majority, if not all of these problems, are taken care of masterfully in the new King's Quest II fan remake. It fills in the plot holes, it expands on the plot, adds new characters, it's... But we'll talk about that later. Join us next time for King's Quest III, To Air is Human. H-E-I-R. <laughs> the puns! <laughs>